Perfect. And I see people are joining. Oh, hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Carlos Murillo. I'm uh, the district representative with the office of Congresswoman Veronica Escobar. Um, just wanted to say thank you this morning for, or this morning, this evening, uh, for taking some time to join our financial aid workshop. Um, we'll give it about a minute or two. We'll let everyone uh, join, get ready, um, listen in. I just wanted to emphasize at the bottom as well, if you want to listen uh, in Spanish, um, or if there's anyone who prefers Spanish, um, at the bottom next to the um, chat is an interpretation. Uh, so if you go ahead and click on that, it'll give you the option for English and Spanish. Um, if you click in Spanish, we have a translator um, who will be translating the entirety of the workshop. Um, if you have any questions throughout the workshop or to start off, um, there's a Q&A function. So feel free to ask any questions. Um, you're also able to ask anonymously um, if, if there's any issue um, or if you don't want to share your question with the entire group, um, please feel free. Uh, we're excited to have everyone join uh, and we'll give it a minute just to let everyone filter in. And then again, just for more people who are joining right now, um, there's an interpretation feature at the bottom of the webinar. Um, if you click on that interpretation feature, it lets you listen to the workshop in Spanish. Um, we have a translator who will be translating the entirety of the workshop. Um, for anyone who prefers uh, to hear it in, in Spanish, um, if you have any questions, again, uh, the Q&A feature is active. You're able to submit questions anonymously. Um, anything that comes up throughout the webinar or anything that you've had previously with your own FAFSA application um, or anything regarding financial aid. Uh, we'll do our best to get every, to every question available. Perfect. All right. So it looks like it's 532. Um, looks like most people have joined already. Um, just again, before we get started, um, the, there's an interpretation function at the bottom of the webinar uh, on Zoom. Uh, if you prefer to listen in Spanish, um, we have Ana, our translator, on who will be translating the entirety of the workshop in Spanish for those who prefer. Um, also, there's the Q&A function please, any questions that come up, um, feel free to ask them. Uh, you can ask them anonymously as well. Um, and so with that, Elizabeth, if you can go ahead and move on uh, to the next slide. Great, so just some session guidelines for everyone, um, for us ourselves too, um, just to remain on mute for the entire presentation, uh, submit your questions to the Q&A inbox. Questions will be answered after the presentation. Um, ask them while the presentation is ongoing. Um, that way we have them ready to go. Um, do not post any sensitive information. Um, no social security numbers, visa numbers, student, student IDs um, like that are necessary. Um, and then stay until the end of the presentation with us uh, for a little bit more information about how to reach out to UTEP and UPCC for additional help with your FAFSA. Oh, next slide. Um, and so unfortunately, the Congresswoman couldn't be with us today, um, just due to some, some prior uh, conflicting schedule requirements, um, but she was able to record a video for us just because of how important uh, higher education uh, is to her. And so Elizabeth, if you can go ahead and play that. Good evening, I'm Veronica Escobar, and I have the incredible privilege of serving as your Congresswoman, uh, serving as the U.S. Representative for Texas 16th Congressional District here in El Paso. First and foremost, thank you all so much for signing up for this very important and hopefully very helpful and useful Financial Aid 101 workshop. We put this workshop together to ensure that our community understands everything that you need to in order to apply for financial aid for higher education. 
As a mother of two kids, uh, one son, my oldest, who graduated from college about a year and a half ago, and a daughter who is still in college, I know full well the stress that comes with filling out the FAFSA, getting it in on time, and making sure that as a parent, you've done everything possible to help your child on their path to higher education. As a college graduate myself, having been very fortunate to be able to attend college here at UTEP, I remember the stress of the FAFSA as a student. And so hopefully you'll get all of the answers that you need this evening in it for a smooth application process. As your Congresswoman, I want you to know how important higher education and access to higher education is for me. I have signed on and helped support and shape dozens of bills in Congress to make college more more affordable and accessible to make sure that our El Paso young people and all El Pasoans who seek a higher education have a pathway that is easy for them because in my view the more education and training that we get the, the more opportunities open up for us in the future please know we are here for you we're here to serve you we're here to help you and we cannot wait um, to see everything that you do all the schools you get into and and everything wonderful that happens along the way on your path to higher education. With that, Carlos, I'll turn it back over to you. Oh, and I appreciate that. Thank you. And the, for those who joined a little bit later, um, my name is Carlos Murillo. I'm with the Office of Congresswoman Brown and Escobar. Um, and I'll be handing it over right now to uh, Diana Valle and Elizabeth Estrada, who can go ahead and introduce themselves. And I guess we'll start with uh, with Diana from from Utah. Hi everyone, thank you so much uh, for joining us today to today's presentation. We are thrilled that you are here um, joining us and that you've had the opportunity uh, to come and learn more about the financial aid process. My name is Diana Valle, and I am the outreach manager in the Student Financial Services Department at UTEP. And also joining us is a representative from EPCC, Elizabeth. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, thank you for joining us this afternoon. It is our pleasure being this evening with you. My name is Elizabeth Estrada. I'm part of um, El Paso Community College Financial Aid Office. I'm a financial aid coordinator. And today we have such a great information to pass on to you. And especially because we've been there and we continue to be there. I um, personally have experienced the same thing, frustrations that you're going through. I experienced those as well throughout my college years. And, and what a great opportunity, I think, has a city, has of um, institutions. We're partnering to do this great events that we're able to come up uh, with and take it to you all and to your hands to give you those resources, to give you those opportunities and to let you know that we're here for you and that we're here to assist you no matter which institution you're planning on attending. We're not here to compete for you. <laughs> we're here for you. We're here to give you the support and to let you know that there are opportunities and yes, you can do it. There are resources available for you to assist you to uh, accomplish your goal, to accomplish uh, and continue your um, education. So today, we're going to talk to you about very important information as far as where to obtain those resources and how um, easy it might be. I know when you hear the word financial aid, it's like, oh my god, what did I get myself into? <laughs> but no, let me let me uh, start off with that. So what is financial aid? Financial aid are those resources available out there that will assist any students to pay for their college, for their education. So uh, financial aid will come in in different shapes and forms. And I want you to imagine this and picture this. I'm very visual. So I'm assuming most of you, a lot of people, uh, oftentimes when I have the opportunity to provide this kind of a workshops, I um, use like, imagine a big umbrella. Under that big umbrella, then there's different pots of money. So that's financial aid. Financial aid, it's the opportunity that will open up the resources for you in a different pots of money, different resources that you'll be able to obtain either from federal 
state or local resources. So that's why it comes the importance of having and knowing the, the different type of resources that there are out there. One of the main uh, or maybe the one fund that you might have heard before, it's the grants. And that's the one that we all would love and love to obtain because it's free money. Technically, it's free money, meaning that money that you don't have to pay back has long, I mean, everything uh, in life has a consequence. So you must be attending um, in order to keep that grant and not having to pay it back and pass um, your classes. Then um, the grants can be neither from a federal or a state funding. And the beauty of this is there is a single application that you have to submit. With that single application, you have the opportunity to uh, access any of this type of funding. Along with that comes the work study program. The work study program, it's a program where um, the students have the ability to earn some wages while they are attending school. Oftentimes these opportunities comes within the same institution or partners within the institution. It could be nonprofit organizations affiliated to some way or some source to the institution. And we have the opportunity to provide that employment. Why? Why would we recommend work study? Because uh, recent uh, studies shows that the more the student spends in the facility or in within the institutions, more likely they will graduate it they will graduate. So we will love to engage the students more and more in, into our institutions and why not provide them with those resources that they need and concentrate more in their education and, and completing their studies. In addition to that, we have loans. For those of you parents, I'm a, I'm a parent as well. And I know you hear the word loans and you wanna run away. Hold on, <laughs> don't run away just yet. <laughs> There's times in, in life, and I think um, all of you will agree with me. There's times that we have to make a commitment or a uh, different type of investment. Higher education is an investment that we have to do in ourselves and our kids. So there's loans, and these are the good loans that we need to obtain when other resources are not there. So that's a great opportunity as well. So once again, all this comes in a single application. Along with that, we have the ability to apply for scholarships. The scholarships, uh, students that apply for the, um, the FAFSA application and they don't automatically apply for scholarships. However, a lot of the funders, a lot of the scholarships will require or will ask the students to apply for FAFSA in order to be eligible for it. So that's why it's another type of resource that comes in within the FAFSA application or within the task file. And then I'll explain you a little bit more uh, once that we get into, into those concepts. So what's the FAFSA? So the FAFSA application is the free application for federal student aid. And I, if you're gonna take something from this evening, take that, free, it's free. <laughs> Don't go out there and pay to apply for this application. Uh, believe me or not, we have found as an institution that people pay for this type of services. We're here for you, for you, for the community. You can go to YouTube, you can come to EPCC and we, pro we will provide you the assistance. We're part of um, collaborative effort within the city that, that you probably have heard as a different high school. Um, we work along with um, the FAFSA nights where we go to different high schools throughout the city and offer our services to assist students to complete their FAFSA. So please don't ever pay for this. This is a, a service we provide to the community and has an institutions, we offer it for free. I mean, it doesn't matter once again, if you're, um, you're welcome to assist to our colleges and universities, but um, if you're planning attending somewhere else, we're here to support you. We're here, we are advocates of higher education. That's what we're here for. So please reach out to us and we will be more than happy to assist you complete your applications. So what's the FAFSA? So it's a free application for federal student aid and this application, the funds that I had talked to you about, this is the application you have to fill out. So in order to access the grants, the work study, the scholarships, the loans, 
you will have to submit this application. And let me just explain you a little bit how is it that it works. So you submit this application. And when you submit that application, within your application, you will be indicating to which institutions or which institution you would like your application to be sent in. So this application is submitted to the Department of Education. Department of Education, it's the one that disseminates those applications to the institution. Then once we receive your application at that point, then that's when we start taking care of your financial aid. But everything starts off with the FAFSA. So you will have to submit that application. Who can apply for the FAFSA? The FAFSA, it's open to um, US citizen, resident, uh, permanent residents or resident aliens. Um, the only ones that are not able to apply for the FAFSA, it's that um, immigrant students or undocumented students. And even for those as the state of, um, has the state of Texas, we're blessed that we do have opportunities for undocumented students as well. And I'll be talking to you about this in a, um, further down within the, the presentation. Um, so the application opens up as of October 1st of every year. For those of you that are uh, high school seniors, right now it's a perfect timing. You're a perfect timing, perfect opportunity to complete your application. The application for the academic year 2021, 2022 just opened up. It opened up uh, as of October 1st. So if you submit your application now, it's perfect timing. And I'm talking about perfect timing because of the different priority deadlines. Because in institutions, we have different priority deadlines depending on the state um, and depending on the institution. Like just to give you an example, between UTEP and us, it's a little bit different. UTEP is um, January 15, us it's March 15. So um, it's a little bit different, but. It, depending on the institution, that will be, uh, that will vary. So um, that will be kind of like part of your homework <laughs> to identify um, what is your prior deadline. So if you do your applications between the months of October, November, December, you're in perfect timing. So it is, right now, it's a great opportunity to complete those applications. So where do, do I complete this application? You will be going to fafsa.gov. And I'll talk to you a little bit more on um, about that. So where do we get started? We have divided kind of like in, the, in three steps. So just to make it a little bit easier for, um, for all of you. One of the things that as a student, you will be needing in order to complete the, the FAFSA will be an FSA ID. The FSA ID is a username and password. And have you might know, I mean, even like when we, with any of our banks or any of different types of business that we might do online, we have to create a username and password. So this is nothing different by um, of that. It's, it's kind of like the same thing. And we need to create a, a username and password that will serve us as our signature within that application. This application, it's completely um, online. So you have resources within the application where you will be able to utilize your FSA ID, username and password to assist you complete that application. The FSA ID can be created at the beginning. I mean, we normally, we do encourage that for students to complete their FSA ID, username and password to create that first and then proceed um, to the application. Now for those students that they are a dependent student and you might be wondering who's a dependent student and who's an independent student? A dependent student is uh, the student that will be needing the information from their parents and an independent student, it's just going by themselves. And we'll talk a little bit more um, in just a bit about that. So parents might need an FSA ID as well. If they have the opportunity to create an FSA ID, it is highly encouraged for them to create an FSA ID. However, for those dependent students that parents might not have the ability of creating an FSA ID in you might be wondering what is it or what, um, under what circumstances uh, parents might not be able to create the FSA ID. And those will be the parents that might not have a social security number. We, as a uh, border city, 
We do have um, a lot of our students that might be um, leaving with siblings and, and parents might be in a different country and that's okay. So in those instances, parents might not have, might not have a, a social security number. So therefore those parents will not be able to create an FSA ID. But if the parent is not able to create an FSA ID, then there's other alternatives for parents to sign that application. Now let's go to our step two, which it's gathering all the different documents that I need. What is it that I need to apply for FAFSA? So if, I'm, if you're with me on this, if you're picturing this, so I'm creating my FSA ID, now what's next? And this is what is what is next. What do I need in order to apply for FAFSA? You're gonna need all your personal information, your demographic information, your social security number. Um, and a lot of times, um, some of our students, please, on your application, you will be entering your official name. Uh, I have uh, experienced students say, well, I go by Johnny, miss, can I put Johnny in there? No, you have to put whatever it's on you. If Johnny is your official name, then yes. But if Johnny is not your official name, no, it has to match your social security card. And the reason being, it's because all this um, data that it's being entered into the, uh, the FAFSA application, the Department of Education match, um, match runs a different um, matches through the application and makes sure that the data is accurate. So if there's no official name, that application will be rejected. Therefore, it translates into a delay for the students when it comes to receiving a, a, an award letter or a notification of letting you know, this is for how much you you will be qualifying for. We won't be able to do that until that is resolved. Then um, alien registration number for those students that are not um, US citizen. Tax information for the 2021, 2022, the application will last for the 2019 tax information. However, parents are able to and um, are able to utilize what it's called the IRS data retrieval tool. And that's a tool that it's integrated within the FAFSA application, meaning that I will probably phys physically will have to have my taxes on hand because through the applications, the, the, the student and the parent will have the ability to retrieve those taxes and just add that information automatically to the application. Department of Education every year, they try to do the most that they can to facilitate the application process for students and parents and try to, um, trying to bring those resources and having them handy for them. And then this is one of them. So this is one of the big plus and benefits of utilizing that FSA ID and creating that FSA ID of hand. Now let's say, well, I forgot about the FSA ID list. I'm sorry, I, <laughs> I did hear your presentation, but I forgot about the FSA ID. And I went straight ahead and started doing my application. And that's okay. Within the application, you have three different instances where you can apply for your FSA ID um, as a student or as a parent. So when you are within the process, you will still have the ability to do, to create your FSA ID. Then, do I need to file taxes in order to be able to qualify for FAFSA or to apply for FAFSA? No, we do have a lot of uh, members of our community that they don't file taxes and you don't have to file taxes. If you don't file taxes, it's okay. Just make sure to have whatever financials you have for that or you had for that 2019 um, tax year. And that's will be, um, you will be reporting that within your application. The application does count with a section that it's on tax income. And this is where that income will be uh, reflected in there. If you have any cash um, savings, checking account, your balances, it doesn't have to be exact to the dot, but the whatever balances are um, available at the time that uh, you are applying, that's what you will be plugging in in there and as well as any investments. So back again to the question, how do, you, how do you know if you are a dependent or independent student? So if we need parents um, information or if um, the, the application itself has a, a section where it talks about that dependency 
and it has already mentioned it to you, it is a smart application. So depending how you're answering those questions, it will make that determination. And if you answer at least yes to any of these questions, then you will be considered an independent student. <coughs> Excuse me. So one of the other tricky questions sometimes is, do you have chil children um, or any legal dependents? We know some of our students might have children already, and but they're living on their parent household and parents are the ones supporting that child and the grandkid as well. So in those instances, and, and this is just one of the, of the tricky questions that we might have a lot of different scenarios and, but I, I just wanted to share this one with you because some of our students do get confused with this and that will avoid a very common mistake that they say, yes, I do have a, a child. Then that will be a no if parents are providing for everything then that, that should be a no, not a yes. Now we go into step three, and this will be um, completing the FAFSA or accessing the FAFSA. You have the ability to complete the application directly at fafsa.gov or better yet, for all those great students, our techie students, we know your generation, you love your phone. <laughs> Please download this app. This is the great app. It's my student aid. I do have it as well, believe me now. <laughs> I have it, it's a great app. And you have the ability of completing your FAFSA neither on the web or on your phone. And what I'm saying, uh, download the app because this is a process you will be doing every year from now on until you graduate. So you want to have this information as handy, the FAFSA application. Once that you submit the FAFSA for the first time, the next time around when you apply, you have the opportunity to click what it says renew or returning student, but it says returning user. So you're just renewing. When you're renewing, a lot of your information that you had already provided will transfer. So it will be a, even, faster and a little bit easier than the first time. And another piece of advice is start building your financial aid folder. And that goes, I guess, for the parents that are with us this evening. Um, this will be great uh, resource to keep on handy. Always keep your, your passwords, your FSA ID, username and password handy, because this is what you will be using throughout. Now, the FAFSA application constitutes of four main sections. And it starts off with the student demographics and then the dependency status that I was talking to you about. And there it's where it will make the determination. Do not expect to see the same number of questions for all students. Remember the, the FAFSA application has this smart logic built in. So depending on how you're answering your FAFSA, it might add or omit some questions that they might not be meeting to the student and, um, and, and it's not applicable to their household. And you might be wondering why. It's because not every, every household is unique. And I had gotten questions from students saying, okay, why is it my friend getting this? And why am I getting this? Okay, because they have a different um, household uh, situation. They might be, you know, more uh, household members attending college, more household members uh, within that particular household or their income might be different or they might be the same um, income, but then there are other components that the Department of Education looks at. The FAFSA application, what it does for the student and, and for us as an institution, it does an assessment of letting us know what type of resources the student needs in order to attend college. So that's why there's so many questions. You might think, oh my God, this is so many questions <laughs> in here, but that, that's the reason why. And they have to ask those questions in order to make, make a better determination. So it starts off with the student demographics and the dependency status. It goes into the school selection. The students have the ability to add up to 10 different institutions within the application. Do I encourage that? No. <laughs> the students will be overwhelmed 
of the amount of emails and information that we'll be receiving from, from different institutions. However, I do encourage you to have options, of course, but limit your options maybe to five. The FAFSA application, uh, we call it like a living document because you always have the ability of going back and make any uh, change, what it's called a correction. You will be able to um, modify any of that information. So if you change your mind, as far as uh, what institution I would like to attend, then they can always go ahead and do that, but not submit it to so many schools, because, and especially because of, of, of the first year. Um, students might be a little bit confused with the whole process. It's a new process and getting used to it to the system and, and to, to the different application, it might be um, overwhelming. Then if the student, it is a dependent student, then they will start um, asking for the demographic information, for the parents' demographic information. And after that, proceed into the financial information for student and parent. Then once the application is submitted, then the student will immediately receive what it's called a student aid report. On, for us, it's known as SAR. <laughs> but I don't want to start with a lingo here. <laughs> so it is a student aid report. And then the student aid report is just a summary of what the student entered on the FAFSA application. It will give him, it will be giving them a preliminary um, EFC, but it's the estimated family contribution number, and that's the number that we use to um, award grant. However, this is not final. This is just, keep in mind, it's a summary of what you just submitted, and oftentimes there are changes to be done. Until the student doesn't receive an award letter, then that's what it's final. That's what the student is qualifying for. And also keeping in mind that when the students receive the SAR report, it's just letting them know about the federal funding that they're qualifying for, but not the state. And us, as an institution, we do have state funding that we provide also to students and other resources that we might have at the time. One of the process that normally um, happens, and please, if you submit your application and you receive a notification from one of us from the institution and saying that you've been selected for verification, don't panic, please. This is just a normal and randomly process. It's, and it's nothing else than we're just verifying the, um, the information that was provided on the application. And you might be wondering why, why am I being selected for verification? And this is a um, randomly process from the Department of Education uh, just to verify a couple of files. And, and for us, we will just be asking you for the documentation of supporting what you said on the FAFSA application. And depending on the institution, UTEP and us, we work hand in hand on this. I mean, we have our process are very similar um, as far as uh, the verification process and the documentation that we ask for as well. It's very similar and won't be nothing else than the uh, documents that you have already on hand. It's just that we will just ask you to submit it to us for to complete the review. Once that we complete that verification process, then we will be able to let the student know um, what is it that they're qualifying for. Now, let me talk to you about the Texas application for um, state financial aid call or known as TASFA for, for all of us. And this is the other type of resources that we have for our students. So um, we're lucky enough and blessed to have this type of resources within the state of Texas. Just to, to let you know, not all states provide resources for undocumented students and, and we're blessed that we are one of them. And um, lucky, uh, fortunate enough to be able to extend those um, resources to our students and, and support them throughout their uh, higher education as well. This application has been, uh, and if you if you look into the format of this application, it's very, very similar to the FAFSA, but now this one is in paper. Um, Texas, we, all of us, all institutions here, we're working, 
and we continue, we'll continue to work for you, for our students, for our community, to make this process easier as we go along. Um, well, in the near future, we're hoping to have this application as well online, but as of right now, it's pretty much a paper application. However, it does have the same components and they will ask you for the same kind of uh, very similar information that is being asked on the FAFSA application. So who can complete this application? Any non-citizen student or document student within the, um, this, the lives in the state of Texas. And same um, deadlines, if, if you um, recall a deadline that I had just talked to you about the FAFSA, it also opens up as of October 1st of every year. And we do highly encourage for those students to submit it as soon as possible, because since this is a state funding and all um, institutions, we, all of us, we receive different type of funding amount. So this is kind of like on the first come first serve. So the soonest, the better. Um, once again, if you should need assistance on completing this application, feel free to reach any of our institutions. We're more than welcome to assist you. Depending on the institution that you will be attending, that's where the application will have to be turned in. So please uh, reach out to us so we can guide you on, into that process. What's the eligibility for, for the TASFA application? They have to be, they have to graduate from a uh, um, Texas high school and they have to have lived in, in Texas for three years prior to graduating from, from high school. And before they enter college, they might have been living in Texas at least for one year. What documentation is required? And this documentation in, in the, on this application, we don't have the ability that we have within the FAFSA application where um, if students and parents have the ability to utilize the IRS data retrieval tool and attach those resources already to the application. This one, it's pretty much um, a paper application. So we do have to ask for all those type of documentation, very similar to the, to the FAFSA application. We need to, for those students that um, are 18 uh, years or older, they have to be registered for selective service. Please, registering for selective service it also applies for FAFSA as well. And please students out there, don't think you're, you're signing up for the service. You're not, you're not joining um, services. This is um, a requirement to receive any federal or state funding. You do have to be registered. So please don't, don't, don't think, um, and then if, if, don't think that way. If you need further explanation on that, let us know and we'll touch bases a little bit more on that. Then uh, if it's student, file taxes, then we need those 2019 taxes. If there's no uh, taxes and they don't have to provide with, with taxes, um, parents, same thing. Parents might have filed taxes if they live here. Parents, um, if they live here in Texas, but parents might not live here. They might be in another country again. So um, it will be the, we're, we're going based on, on the student, but we still will be needing proof of that source of income for, for that particular student. We know that some parents might not file and, um, or might file, or might um, have filed taxes, depending on, on, the, uh, on the case. Tax file becomes a little bit tricky when it comes to the documentation and stuff, we highly encourage you to reach out to us if you should have any questions on this. Um, one of the things that, that it's that we do ask for a non-filer for those that don't file taxes, but if parents do not have a, so, do not have a social security number, then they will not be able to reproduce like a non-filer's letter because there will be no record found in there. So we have alternative paperwork where the student can turn that in. So just please feel free to reach out to us and we will guide you throughout the process. Then after your applications have been submitted and we have completed a verification process either on the FAFSA or completed your um, complete evaluation through the TASFA application, then that's when the student will be receiving an award letter or an award offer. And this offer is just to let the student know, okay, this is based on the information you 
uh, we receive and, and what we have reviewed, this is what you're qualifying for. At that point, it will be listed in the federal, state, and even local resources if, if it's applicable for the student. And then at all times, once the student submits those applications, they have the ability to apply, of course, for any scholarships as well. So I've been um, emphasizing about this throughout the, the presentation. We are, we are both of us, uh, both institutions, we are uh, available for any of you for, for our community. It is a pleasure to serve and, and to be advocates for higher education. We um, extend our invitation to reach out to us if you should have any questions as far as how to fill out this application, the FAFSA, the TASFA, or maybe you're curious about the process, or maybe there's something that um, you have questions on. We have plenty of resources to, to provide. I know um, Carlos will be providing some of those resources as well to you all. Uh, the Department of Education has a, a variety of resources of, of, that comes on all shapes and forms for you all, but please keep in mind, we're here. We're here for you to assist you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, send us an email. We know that um, these are our unprecedented times for, for all of us. And But nevertheless, we're here as a community. We have come together to make this happen and we'll continue to work hard for, for all of you, for our community. Incredible, thank you, Elizabeth. And those phone numbers on the screen, are those specifically for the financial aid offices? Correct. Perfect. And what are the hours for, for those financial aid offices? It's Monday through Friday, correct? Monday through Friday, we at EPCC, we're available from May 30 to 530. At UTEP, we are from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Perfect. And then, you know, there's emails on there. Um, you know, I've, I've emailed financial aid at UTEP and EPCC. Um, very responsive. Um, and Diana, I just wanted to say thank you for, for answering questions in the chat um, throughout the presentation. I'm going to go ahead and, and just read them out. And then Elizabeth, if you have anything to input um, from EPCC's end or just from your general knowledge, um, feel free to jump in. Um, yeah, so I'll just go from the top down, um, starting with a question from Jorge Villalobos. Um, he mentioned, you know, after finishing the FAFSA form, how soon will you hear from the college? Um, Diana was able to answer that at UTEP, um, they begin sending award office offers, pardon me, with information about a student's financial aid eligibility in late April or early May. Um, each college or university is different, um, but what is EPCC? Do they send it within that same time frame or? Yes, more likely we're within the same time frame. Um, and any other type of um, notification, if we should need any additional documentation, will come in a little bit before. But um, you, Tip, and I, we're kind of like in the same page. Yes. Perfect. And and just from personal experience, um, from from my undergrad and, and my grad school, um, my FAFSA notifications also came in uh, in late April and early May. Um, and one was a public university, another one was a, was a private, just, uh, just to add some context. Um, below that, we have an anonymous attendee um, who asked, do we have to fill out the FAFSA application uh, to get into work study? Um, Diane answered, yes, um, you do need to complete the FAFSA um, to apply for federal work study. Um, that is true. Um, below that, we have another anonymous attendee. Um, what, when will I know what type of financial aid I got from the three types? Um, Diana was able to answer that once you submit your FAFSA, um, there's a congratulations page. Um, Diana, where is that congratulations page? Is that in the same application website? Yes, when you are on uh, FAFSA.gov and you are submitting your information, when you click submit, it will bring up a congratulations page and towards the middle, it will have your eligibility, estimated eligibility amounts. Perfect. Okay, so then once you complete that application, there's a congratulations page um, with estimates. Um, and she also mentioned that colleges and universities provide award office offers, um, which outline, you know, different types and amounts of financial aid that you qualify for. Um, and timeframes vary, of course, by institutions. Um, I don't know, Elizabeth, if, if EPCC has specific timeframes for that um, outside of the late April or early May for work study. Well, we uh, has a work study 
students have always the ability to apply for work study, even if they haven't, some students might not indicate that they're interested in work study within the application. So even if they're interested at that point, then uh, as soon as they let us know, then we can start looking into that and, and have them, um, if they're eligible, um, um, apply for the work study positions available. Perfect. And then Mr. Juan Perez asks, um, he's currently a student at EPCC, uh, looking to transfer to UTEP next spring semester. Uh, no bad blood, right, between EPCC and UTEP been transferring? <laughs> no, uh, we, we would love to take him hand by hand. I mean, we're working together on that. That We understand we want them to succeed and continue. Yes, sorry. it's perfect. 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 And he's asking based on his parents' income, um, he feels that he may not qualify for grants. Um, and so Diane answered that to make sure that he reviews his 2020-2021 uh, FAFSA to ensure that he added UTEP as one of the schools of interest. Um, and then once added, they can contact UTEP uh, to review eligibility. And so Diana, is there is there anything to add on that or in terms of the financial aid for UTEP if he feels he may not qualify? No, that's pretty much it for us. Um, the student can definitely just uh, contact us and we can go from there. Perfect. And then below that, we have an anonymous attendee um, who asked if they're not in good academic standing, do they still qualify for loans through FAFSA? Yes, I mean, and this is a, um, that's a great question because, um, and that I forgot to mention. <laughs> Uh, yes, I mean, uh, student loans, they're not based uh, on the student part of it. They're not based on the FICO score. Like normally, you know, when you go to a bank or to any financial institution to obtain a loan, they will run your credit to see if you qualify for, well, student loans are not. When it comes to the parent, if the parent is requesting a loan for the student, then yes. That, um, that will be based on credit, but when it's the student, then it's... Uh, they're not running it. However, it will be a good opportunity for the students to start building credit there as well. Perfect. And then below that, a similar question is just regarding the FAFSA. Um, if you don't fill out the FAFSA, someone asks, can you still receive grants and scholarships? Um, Diana mentioned that yes, but for grants and certain scholarships, they do require the submission of a FAFSA. Um, it, Go ahead, sorry. No, 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 it's okay. And, and the reason being it's because we need a, a need assessment um, for even our state grants and, and our federal grants. I mean, we that's what we ask students to complete the FAFSA. So, um, and, and this, this comes that you have to be fair across the board, across the board to all students and making it fair for everybody. So in order to be able to do that, then that's how we are able to determine, okay, this student needs this, much of money in order to come into our institutions. And then I just want to answer this present this question as well. Um, an anonymous attendee asked, will this presentation be shared with us? Um, this is all great information. Yes. So everyone who registered um, will be receiving a link with this presentation once it's been recorded and uploaded. Um, I'll reach back out with that and then additional information regarding resources at, at UTEP uh, and EPCC. Uh, so hopefully that everything will be ready um, by Friday. If it's not, feel free to reach out to me. Um, everyone has my email, carlos.murillo at mail.house.gov. Um, so I'll go ahead and answer that one. Um, and then under that, Ms. Nalani Miranda asks, if you get all of your tuition paid, um, such as through the paid or promise, could you still do work study for additional fees and cost of living? And the answer for that is yes, um, because the Pedro promise, it's just for tuition and fees, but there, when you request financial aid, it's also to help you cover other expenses such as books and supplies, um, transportation, housing, all of that. So you would still need to submit your FAFSA um, and you can receive a combination of, of the grants and also um, any other financial aid that you qualify for, it's, it's completely okay. And anything to add, Elizabeth, or? No, 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 yeah, no. Perfect, and then a, a similar question, uh, does the pay dirt promise cover dorms for students that don't live or don't live in or near El Paso? 
Okay, and as a reminder for the Peter Promise, um, it is only for tuition and fees. And also just to add for the Peter Promise, you do have to be a Texas resident. Um, so that's also a factor to consider. Perfect, so only tuition and fees, right? No, no dorms. Right, tuition and fees, uh, the student, of course, there's other eligibility requirements, um, is such as being a full-time student, uh, being a Texas resident, um, but if they would like more information, then you can definitely contact us and we can look at your specific um, situation and we will let you know if you qualify. Perfect, all right. And then we're going back to the answered questions, Diana, thank you so much. Um, and so here, this one was from an anonymous attendee. Um, when do we have to have our application for FAFSA done for Utah? Um, so Dan, I know you answered that priority is January 15th. Can you expand a little bit on priority deadline versus just the general deadline? Yes, so priority deadline, what that means, it's not the last date that you can submit your FAFSA. The priority deadline is just um, for some grants that are first come first serve or are limited funding. Uh, we take into consideration those students that applied before January 15th uh, to be able to provide those grants. Any students that applied after January 15th, they may not necessarily have the opportunity um, to be eligible for those. Uh, that's why we always recommend as soon as the FAFSA comes out on January 1st every year, try to complete it between January 1st, uh, between October 1st and January 15th. Um, but the student, even after January 15th, the student can still go in and apply. And just to add a little bit to, to that, um, even for those students, and, and we had had instances where the students did not submit their application and they already registered for school, school starts next week, and they ended up paying for classes. Well, as long as they apply, they, oh, they can always get reimbursed. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. And then here we have a couple of more open questions. Um, we'll make sure to get through all of them here. Um, so Megan O'Toole had asked, you know, she was just accepted into an online Master of Fine Arts program uh, that starts in January. If she hasn't applied for FAFSA yet, is it too late? What happens if you apply so close to registering for classes? Um, Diana had mentioned that it's not too late. However, they, we recommend, just as we had mentioned, completing your FAFSA as soon as possible um, for, for those grants and those scholarships with limited funding, um, because uh, a lot of folks, you know, understand the FAFSA is, you know, kind of a first come, first serve if you're eligible. There's only so many amount of funds to come in. Um, Elizabeth, I don't know if you wanted to add a little bit to that. No, no, I mean, um, you said it just right. I mean, it's just that, um, yeah, it is, uh, there's no deadline for them to submit the, the, the FAFSA. It's technically at the end of the, of the academic year when it comes to deadline for, for FAFSA. So there's always the opportunity for them to submit that application. Perfect, thank you. And then the, we've seen this question actually a few times, um, but Gabriel Meraz had asked, what if I'm a citizen, um, but my parents aren't? So if a student is, is a US citizen, but their parents are, are Mexican nationals, residents, immigrants, does that affect their FAFSA application? No, it does not affect their FAFSA application. As long as a student, it's the US citizen or, or a resident alien, then they're okay. Perfect. And then Diana, you mentioned uh, in the social security fields, they should enter all zeros, correct? Yes, uh, they don't have to have a social security number. They can enter all zeros. In addition, I just want to add at the, um, if you are a dependent student and you need your parents' information, at the end of the FAFSA, it will ask for a parent's signature. Um, and typically for parents that are US citizens, they can go in and create their own FSA ID and sign that way, sign electronically with their FSA ID and password. Um, but of course, if the parents are Mexican nationals, um, they don't have a social security number, then there's a different way to sign that FAFSA application. Um, they would just need to select the option to print a signature page uh, they will need to uh, print it. The, the parent will physically sign the form and it will have to be mailed to the address that's on the form. And that's how they can get their, uh, the parent's uh, signature submitted. Perfect, thank you. And I feel like this next question also applies um, to a lot of students out there just because of the COVID pandemic. Um, so Jorge Villalobos had asked, you know, what 
should I do um, to fill out a special circumstance letter? Um, his father lost employment and regained another job um, at half his salary. Um, they had filled out their FAFSA using the 2019 tax form, um, which, but he has lost a considerable amount of pay. Um, Diane, I know you mentioned that they should contact the institution they will be attending. Um, you know, is it is it a specific process to reach out to their uh, financial aid office or? Yes, at least, um, and I'm not sure how EPCC works, but there is a form that we can provide the students that they will need to submit. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure it's the same thing for EPCC. Uh, they just need to request that form, but it is um, university specific or college specific. Uh, so it, they would have to request it from that university or college where they will be attending. Yes, and like for us, it, yes, I mean, there is a, a form and we do have that process in place. And it's uh, the special circumstance. I mean, I don't know if um, for you it's named the same way, Diana, but uh, for you, Tip. And um, I know I keep saying you and me, <laughs> but yes, I mean, it's, it, we, can, we have very similar processes between both um, offices, uh, between the financial aid offices. And then for EPCC, it's called special circumstances. And, and definitely um, please reach out to, if you're part of any of our institutions, reach out to any of our offices so we can assist you and provide you those resources. We are, uh, we know this is an unprecedented time and, and we have to make adjustments and make it happen. And those are the resources as an institution that we have in order to make it happen for our students. Perfect, thank you. And just you. a side note, oh, I'm sorry, Carlos, just a side no, note no, for no. UTEP, uh, the form is called an income adjustment. Perfect, and if anyone has any questions regarding that, feel free to type them in. Um, or if anything comes up after, feel free to email me as well um, or email the financial aid departments uh, on the screen. Um, Juan Ortiz asked, if he was awarded last year's FAFSA, is it still possible that he isn't awarded for this upcoming year? Um, how likely is this to happen? Uh, Diana, you mentioned that eligibility varies um, every year on, on tax income and the different uh, required information that the FAFSA yields. Um, and so the same applies, I believe, at, at EPCC, correct, Elizabeth? Correct, yes. I mean, and, and I mean, we cannot sit here and say, yes, you will be qualified until that application is technically submitted and, and review on, on the Department of Education. But yes, nevertheless, always um, there, there is a saying that from, from someone that um, I learned when I was uh, first starting at EPCC, and, the, and that one is, apply for um, for FAFSA, everybody will qualify for something. That's a guarantee at 100%. So if you don't qualify for the grants, you will always be able to qualify for the loans or any other type of resources out there. And that actually answered uh, the next question, which was Juan Perez, you know, what's the minimum uh, income threshold to be eligible for grants and if he's still required to fill out a FAFSA? Um, so like Elizabeth had just stated, you know, fill out the FAFSA, you, you'll be eligible for something um, if you're not eligible for the specific grants that you're looking for. Um, and then here, um, Megan O'Toole asked, does she need to remember her FAFSA account uh, from 10 years ago when she when applying for their bachelor's degree, um, or do you need to create a new account? Um, Diana mentioned that she has to use the same FSA ID. Um, yeah, throughout the years, the process have might change. So maybe back then it was what it's called, what's called a PIN, personal notification number. And then it, throughout the years, we transitioned to an FSA ID. So she might need to, um, if she doesn't recall um, that type of information, she can always reach out to the Department of Education and they can reset everything for her and she can start all over. Perfect. Uh, and that's true. And if there's a, and then just, this is in terms of our office. Our office offers uh, casework services. Um, so if anyone has an issue uh, communicating with the Department of Education uh, or is going through, um, applying through a debt reduction, a payment reduction with their loan provider um, and they need communication or they need to know where that application stands, um, our office can reach out to the Department of Education on your behalf um, through our casework services. Um, and we're happy to do so um, you know, and all you need to do is reach out to our office um, at 915-541-1400.
um, or again, email me and I'm, we'll connect you um, to the correct, to my correct colleague um, for that. And moving forward um, here, um, an anonymous attendee asks, what if my parents are married, but one has a social security number? Um, so again, this applies to those who um, have parents who are not US citizens as well. Um, if a parent does not have a social security number, um, just enters all zeros into that field when applying, uh, when filling out your FAFSA. And then here, um, Megan O'Toole asked, are online students who live in El Paso eligible for work study positions? Um, the answer, you answered, yes, it is possible, um, but make sure to contact your university uh, for available positions. Here below, um, someone had asked what if I'm currently an independent student, um, but his parents claimed them as a dependent at the end of 2019, do they still apply as independent for 2021? Um, or how does that apply? If it's a, um, already being considered an independent student, it doesn't matter by who it gets claimed. Um, um, this is, a, and I'm glad that they made this question because it's a mess. Uh, perception out there sometimes that um, students believe whoever claims me that's whoever needs to be add or put in in my FAFSA application but that's not always the case um, it, it goes into who has the dependency of that student and, and things of that nature and just to give you an example for instance maybe um, this is a student that might be living with grandparents and grandparents get, get to claim that student because it's living under their household. However, the parents for that particular student, they might live in, in Juarez, perhaps. And so that student belongs to the household where his parents are at. So in his FAFSA application, he will be listing the income from the parents in Juarez, not uh, so much for the grandparents, even though the student had um, got claim by the grandparents. And I just want to add that for um, the FAFSA will guide you. It's very intuitive. So depending on what you answer for each question, it will determine whether you're an independent or dependent student. So it's not necessarily based on um, if you were claimed in the tax returns, uh, that doesn't matter. It's going to depend on the question, the answers that you provide on your FAFSA and, and the application will let you know whether you're an independent or dependent student. Perfect, and this question is uh, for you, Elizabeth. Um, Someone asked that their child is going to EPCC um, and is in the process and, or wants to get an associate's degree. Um, however, he also wants to get an electrical technology certificate. Would financial aid pay for the certificate as well or only for the associate's degree? It will, we will be able to make some extensions. There is um, a process called uh, where we look into the degree evaluation, but students have the opportunity to do kind of like a change of major or depending on the number of hours are being utilized there. Um, we will be more than happy to assist the student. Please refer them over to our, our office. Please reach out to us and we will be able to guide the student through the process. Oh, perfect, thank you. Um, and then here it says, uh, can you apply for a FAFSA without having the tax return on the document? Uh, Diana, you answered that certainly, you just have to make sure to enter any income earned even if you did not file a tax return. And then just below that, um, we have another question um, where someone had applied to several colleges and they offered merit scholarships. Um, will, this in, will merit scholarships affect anyone's financial, uh, student, federal financial aid? Um, and so uh, from what you've seen, Diana, um, you mentioned that students are able to receive financial aid um, and merit-based scholarships. Um, and right. it, from my knowledge, merit-based scholarships don't impact someone's financial uh, FAFSA, basically. No. The student can receive um, a combination. They can receive um, grants, loans in combination to scholarships. Um, it, they can uh, receive various. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and so it says here, um, Jose Rodriguez asks, what documents are needed? Uh, to use if he's a Mexican parent with no federal tax return. Um, Diana, you mentioned that if he has a Mexico tax report, um, he can use that document to report his income on his child's FAFSA. Um, 
and then any income earned in a foreign country will need to convert the 2019 tax amounts to US dollars. Um, does EPCC and UTEP assist with that? Yes, um, it could be. I mean, uh, and then if it's from, from Mexico, we'll be from Hacienda. Normally, <laughs> what we call from, from, from the Hacienda uh, documents, if they file taxes, if not, in the event that a student is selected for verification, if for um, a letter from their employer will work for us, just letting us know how much is it that they earn throughout the year, if they're not um, parents that will be filing for any uh, taxes, or even if they're self-employed, then they just need to do a letter for us. Perfect. And then just to reiterate, someone had asked um, if they can apply to the TAFSFA, which is the Texas Student Federal Aid application, mm -hmm. uh, if they live in Juarez. Um, so you need to be a Texas resident to apply to the TAFSFA. Um, but they also mentioned, uh, Elizabeth, if you could repeat the required amount of time uh, that they had to be a Texas resident in order to apply. Three years. They must have lived in Texas for three years. And that's uh, if they're applying from high school, correct? Correct. They have to have graduated from a, a Texas high school or obtained their, their GED through, a, through Texas. Perfect. And then another question here um, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, can I still apply for financial aid even if I'm in the 11th grade? Um, Diana, you answered that yes, you can certainly apply as long as you will be a high school graduate um, for the year that you are applying for FAFSA. So even if you're a junior, you can get a head start. Yes, and that um, some juniors, they complete their FAFSA because they want to start right away in the summer semester. Um, so they would be eligible to, uh, to complete uh, the FAFSA as long as for that year, they will be a high school graduate. And just to add a little bit to what Diana was saying, yes, because the, the application for it, and that's not the same for all institutions, but for most institutions, our academic cycle or the application cycle, like for example, for this application, that 2021-2022, it will start off uh, covering the student fall of 2021, spring of 2022, and summer of 2022. So that's what it will cover the, the student throughout. So that's why um, we do encourage students to apply as soon as possible. Perfect. And then I just want to give everyone, uh, it looks like we'll be wrapping up in about like five to six minutes, um, just in terms of time constraints to be aware of everybody's time. Um, but we'll get through um, the remaining questions that are open. Um, so here, Carlos Vizcaino asks, can you still qualify for FAFSA even after using VA benefits? Um, so those, those are uh, veteran affairs benefits such as the Hazelwood Act. Yes, and the answer is yes, just because um, for VA benefits such as Hazelwood, some, it typically covers tuition and fees only. Um, but like I mentioned before, the FAFSA is also used uh, for books and supplies, uh, for housing um, and other expenses that you may have as a college student. So you can definitely, uh, we recommend students still apply for the FAFSA, even if they're going to be receiving any type of military benefits. Perfect. And then an anonymous, anonymous attendee asked, um, is the virtual appointment scheduler at EPCC and UTEP um, for help in filling out the FAFSA? Um, they want to know exactly what that virtual uh, appointment scheduler is for. Um, Go ahead, Liz. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, for um, for APCC, it, it's not a scheduler for us. For us, um, that link will take you directly to a, a live representative, and they will be able to assist you right then and there to complete your your FAFSA application or any other inquiry that you might have related to financial aid. So, um, students, anybody is welcome to um, join us, and we're available Monday through Friday from May thirty to five thirty. And at UTEP, uh, we do have this, the scheduler is to make an appointment with the financial aid advisor. Um, and you can ask any questions about the FAFSA process if you'd like. Um, you could also, um, if you need help step by step for the FAFSA, that's fine. If you have general financial aid questions, we can help with that. Um, it's completely open uh, for whatever help you need. And you don't necessarily have to be a UTEP student to be able to uh, use that service. Perfect. And then uh, just another question regarding the PATER program. Uh, are grad school students able to apply to the PATER program? 
For the Peter Promise, it's not a separate application that you have to submit. Once you complete the FAFSA, and like I said, if you do it uh, before the priority deadline, January 15th, um, then, and if you're eligible, then you will be automatically given that award, but there's not a separate application. Um, but yes, if you are a high school senior and you're completing your FAFSA for the next, um, for the upcoming um, academic year, and you qualify, then it will be automatically uh, included in your awards. Perfect. And then another anonymous attendee asked, is FAFSA only for students with a degree plan or can they apply if they're only taking individual classes? One of the, uh, the requirements, and this is from the Department of Education, they must declare a program that they're following. And just to be conscious about it as well, uh, the Pell Grant um, and the loans, they have a limit. Um, this changed a couple of years back where um, before students could be attending college and taking classes, but Department of Education noticed and found out that, well, they're not accomplishing um, their degrees. They're not earning degrees. So now they have uh, put a limit. So there's a limit of the amount of Pell Grant that a student can receive throughout college. In, 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 in university. So um, we do encourage the students to, yeah, to have a plan and, and look up to our institutions. We do have um, other offices within our institutions that will be able to as assist us. And not only us, any institution will offer the type, uh, this type of uh, services, career services, where they'll be able to guide students through, um, through a pad and, and to find what is it that there is their interest. And then another anonymous attendee asked if they can apply for the FAFSA um, if they plan to be a part-time student. So kind of running around the same time, as long as they're applying for a degree, correct? Correct. Um, yes. And, and, and that's a good question as well, because the students sometimes have that misperception that I have to be a full-time student, but um, uh, not all of us are able to be able to be a full-time student. Full-time student, it is a, a lot of work, and we do encourage full-time um, enrollment. However, we know that sometimes transitioning will learn at a different pace. So not all of us are prepared sometimes to be a full-time student until later on, uh, on, uh, on our college career. So definitely, I mean, students might qualify at different levels. It doesn't have to be full-time or part-time, or even if it's just taking a class, it might still qualify for some sort of type of aid. So um, please apply for the FAFSA. Perfect. And then we'll get through the anonymous questions just because there's no contact information for them. Um, there's four left. Uh, the first one being, do we need to be registered for classes for the next semester before we apply for FAFSA? No, I mean, this is a process that kind of goes hand by hand, but it can be done individually. You don't, you don't have to be enrolled in order to apply for FAFSA or even have even applied for admissions at the institutions when you're applying for FAFSA. I mean, those are processes that goes kind of like hand by hand, but they don't have to be done um, at the same time. Perfect. And then here, someone had asked that when I had my mother approved sign my FAFSA, um, it said it was not accepted. So who can they reach out to um, so they can know it can be signed and approved um, or have available their mother's FAFSA so they can fully, fully finish their own? They can reach to any of us and we can look into it. I mean, any of our institutions so we can assist them to see what is it that it's not allowing them or what part is it that... Um, it's being rejected out there. Uh, and Mr. Diego Salazar asked uh, that he wanted to set up an appointment to TSI and he's tried by email, um, but he's been rejected by the EPCC server. Um, so he's asking if you can provide him with a contact name or a link, Elizabeth, um, to get that set up. Um, if it's with the server, then it will have to be with, within our help desk. Um, he could give him a call to 831 6440 and they will be able to set up his credentials and all that stuff so he will be able to complete that process and the number is 915-631-6440 831 831 uh-huh 831-6440 perfect and the, mr salazar i pasted that phone number in response to your question um so you can have it there um, and then here, Mr. Carlos Piscano asks, at what age can he apply as an independent? 
he's been a dependent on his father's benefit, but once he completed his bachelor's degree uh, next year, he'll be 25 and will have used all his benefits as a dependent. If he's already 25, he's already an independent student. Um, if at the age of 24, if there are any of the other conditions have not met, then uh, automatically uh, the student becomes independent student. And also by completing their bachelor's degree, they become independent students. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And it looks like that. Oh, we have one more. Um, will the FAFSA be affected depending on the university? So is your, I guess, is your financial aid application impacted depending on where you go or is it based solely on their own eligibility? No, I guess, and this is a great question as well, because some of our students say, well, if I apply for, and I'm just going to put both of our institutions as an example, if I apply for UTEP, I will get more, or if I apply for APCC, I will get more. Technically, the, the same type of um, funding that they're qualifying for the federal uh, piece of it will be the same. What it differs and changes, it's a different state funding. Has a, a university, uh, for example, UTEP, the tuition has to be higher. It's in a university than APCC, where a two year institution where a students earn up to associate's degree. And then a UTEP students have the ability of earning the bachelor's degree and master's and, and so on. So um, that's what it might differ. And then therefore, UTEP will have more resources to assist those students to complete those financial aid packages versus to what we might have at uh, one point. Perfect. And then an anonymous, anonymous attendee asks, do you know if classes will be full, fully virtual next semester? Diana, I know you answered that you expect spring courses to continue being virtual. Um, Elizabeth, do you have any insight for EPCC? Um, most of them are. Uh, most of them, they are online, but however, we do offer uh, certificates and, and other different type of, of programs. So there's some programs that they do have to be like uh, uh, in person. So those will be, uh, will continue the same way and we'll continue to monitor the, the guidelines uh, recommended for our institutions and, and for, from our precedents and stuff. So, and, and both of our institutions were very closely with um with uh, the city guidelines and all that stuff so we just keep an eye on our my best uh piece of advice mm -hmm. keep an eye to our websites we do um we have uh, at epcc we have a, a website as just with this specific information and it's um, has to, as soon as you log into epcc.edu you'll find all those resources available to to our, our community and students Perfect. Thank you. And it looks like it looks like we got through all 51 questions. Thank you, everyone, for for asking and and letting us answer. Um, there's plenty of of uh, you know of additional questions that may come up after. Um, contact information for UTEP and EPCC is on the screen. Um, for those of you who registered, uh, you received an email for Zoom with my email on bottom. Uh, you can go ahead and, and reach out to me directly if you have any additional questions. Uh, if anything comes up, or if you have an issue with the Department of Education, um, the Congresswoman in, in our office are happy to help. Um, and other than that, I mean, I just want to wish everyone uh, a great Tuesday. I hope everyone had a great holiday start. Um, I hope everyone stays safe. Um, and just again, thank you, Elizabeth and, and Diana for, for putting this on together and partnering with us and, and taking the time to help our community. It is a pleasure. We're here to, to serve anytime. <laughs> Definitely, and don't forget to take advantage of our uh, contact information. Uh, if you need any assistance, we're here to help. Fill out your FAFSA and stay safe. <laughs> um, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. I'll go ahead and end the Zoom call. Oh, thank you again for your time. Oh, bye.